joy for the Son of God is the saving one, is the saving one. Shout for joy, see what love has done. He has come for us, he's the saving one. Yeah, I'm on. Good morning, church. Good morning. God bless you. I need all of you to stand to your feet this morning because we're here to worship Jesus Christ. We can do that while we're sitting down, but we can do it with some energy when we're standing up. Amen. So right now, before we do this, we're going to turn around and we're going to shake each other's hand after we pray and invite the spirit of the living God here. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you for being here this morning. We thank you for being at First Church. We ask that you receive, you receive our adoration. You receive our prayer and it's acceptable to you, Lord. So Lord, from the core of our being and from our voice and from our whole body, Father God, let us worship Jesus Christ today. For it is he we love. It is he that is the Lord of lords we thank you in jesus name we pray and everybody said amen so right now take a few minutes and shake hands with everybody
truth, Lord, above all, you are creator and we stand in awe at the works of your hand, the ways of your heart. This is the cry of your is a great tune even if you don't know it it's just so powerful right everyone's up here moving it's just beautiful um okay next um sorry guys you are my king we know this one Thank you, 
this time we want to open up these altars. If Jesus Christ is your king, come to the king. Bring him your burdens. Bring him, bring him your sickness. Bring him your relationships. Bring him your marriage. Bring him your family. Bring him everything that you've been carrying that you're not supposed to carry. And bring it to Jesus. But also bring him your thanks. Bring him your thankful heart that he is your savior, that he is your king. Come. One, two. I hear the savior say, 
Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Father God, today we come to you and we acknowledge that you're bigger than our problems. You're bigger than the obstacles that we face. You're more powerful than the power they have over us. So we turn to you today, Lord Jesus, and we give you our lives, we give you our hearts, we give you our souls, we give you our attention. We surrender to you today, Lord, because the things of this earth are too heavy for us. They weren't meant for us to carry. So today, Lord, we bring you our sickness. The sickness of disease, the sickness of viruses, the sickness of death itself. We bring to you, Lord Jesus, because you made the victory over death. You conquered everything. The blood you shed is more powerful. So, Lord, we lay this down to you. We surrender so that you can heal us. Father, we also bring to you our marriages. Some of our marriages are falling apart, and we've lost that respect and honor for one another. So we give you our marriages and ask you to restore them and rebuild them, reshape them, and help them to be marriages that show the love we have for Jesus Christ, we have in our marriage. Father, we bring to you our children, our little baby infants and those in elementary school and high school and junior high school, students in college, Father God. We bring them all to you and ask that you keep them from harm and deliver them from evil. And we ask that the seeds planted in them are going to grow and grow into dependence upon Jesus Christ so that these young people will serve you with all of their hearts. Father, we thank you for being in our neighborhoods and helping us to be a beacon of light to a dark neighborhood. We pray that the love of Jesus Christ, which shines through us, will shine into our relationships with our neighbors and we will be kind to them. We will be kind to the unkind neighbor. We will help the one who's trying to hurt and destroy things in our own neighborhood. We are going to be used by God to help build it up. Thank you, Father God, for letting us make a difference in our own neighborhoods. Father, today we specifically hold up Marvin and Tinsel Caps to you. And we ask that you intervene with your mercy and compassion into their lives, Father God. They need a miracle. They need your mercy. They need your strength. They need your presence in such a strong way. You will uphold them. And we thank you for them, that they have been a beacon of light to this fellowship. We thank you for that. We ask that you be with those who have been grieving the death of someone very close in their lives. And we pray that your presence is so strong in their life that they will say, yes, I'm choosing to worship Jesus Christ in the midst of my grief and pain and my broken emotions and my void. I'm choosing to worship Jesus Christ through that because that is where my help comes from. And you are my God. Thank you, Father God, for the goodness that you just flood upon each one of us, Father God, even when we don't expect it. You're there meeting our need before we know we even have a need. Thank you for being our God, for touching our life, and for ministering life through us. We worship you today in spirit and in truth, for it is Jesus Christ who is Lord. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leopard spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus made it all, all to him.
This is a Chris Tomlin song. You probably know it. It's a great song. And we are going to perform this for you now, I think. I hope. Okay. Ready? Ready? Here's our one. This is Made to Worship, Chris Tomlin. Before the day, before the before the world revolved around the sun, God on high stepped out into time and wrote the story of his love for everyone. He has filled our hearts with wonder. filled our hearts with wonder so that we always remember you and I were made to worship you and I are called to love you and I are forgiven and free mm -hmm. you and I embrace surrender you and I choose to believe that you and I And the rocks cry out, even the heavens shout at the sound of his holy name. So let every voice sing out, let every knee bow down, he is worthy of all praise. You and I were made to worship, you and I were called to love. You and I are forgiven and free, whoa. You and I embrace surrender. You and I choose to believe in you and I will see. You and I were made to worship. You and I were called to love. You and I are forgiven and free. You and I choose to believe in you and I will see we were meant to be. Yeah, we were meant to be. Oh. That's Tyler Miles on bass and Sophie Snowfo on piano. Yes. Thank you. They're so good. <clears throat> Thank you. Did you know that? I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. <laughs> Did you know that we are made to worship? We're not made to just go through the motions of this world. We're made to worship Jesus Christ. So let that be the center of your thoughts. Let that be what motivates you at your work worship Jesus through all of that. Amen? Amen. Right now, we want to dismiss all our wonderful, beautiful kids to Kids Connection so that they can worship Jesus Christ in Kids Connection with Miss Michelle. Can you give them a hand as they leave this morning? 
What a beautiful group. Amen. Now, today is a very special day. And I get to introduce, Pastor Lloyd, come on up here. Come on up here. A dear friend of mine. Amen. Give him a hand. Before you know anything, this here is a man of great faith. He is a dear friend. He is a pastor who loves Jesus Christ. He is a man who serves the Lord Jesus Christ. He pastored up in paradise. He's going to tell us the story of what, of the hope that comes from paradise. Amen? So I want everybody to just tune in, and I want you to listen to his story, but respond to Jesus Christ through all of this. Amen? Welcome, Pastor Lloyd Tremaine. Let's pray. Father, we transition our hearts not away from you, but continually before you. Hearing who you are and what you have for us, we've worshiped you. We've celebrated your presence with us. And Lord, we're ready now again to receive from you. Take the words of my lips, anoint them with the power of your spirit. Move us, O oh Lord God, into the place where you are moving and working in us for the purposes you have through Christ Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. Today I'm blessed to have my wife, Diana, with me. She's here and she's going to be sharing with you in just a moment. My mom is also here with me today. Uh, she's... We're, we're all displaced into Sacramento. And in that displacement, that means that there's a new thing happening. Okay? Go ahead. Paul, in his life in the Bible, had been through many disasters of his own. But he wrote these words in the middle of what he had been through. See the words from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. They say this, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, I know none of you are, it's just me. <laughs> Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Amen? Anyone being renewed day by day? What? That's all? Oh, we've got some work, Marsha. Oh, the Spirit of God has some work to do. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is just temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The seen is temporary things. Our family knows a little bit about that because we've lost our homes. We've lost cars. We've lost our temporary values and valuables, not our values, we keep those. But our valuables, the memories, the things that we had. There was the first Sunday of November and we came to church to worship and this was the first slide there that showed what we were celebrating together. As we'd come into worship in paradise, it was fall. We were ready for the glorious things that were going to be happening during the fall season in our church. We sang, and I preached from 1 Peter on living as free people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's... Most people stop there. They don't like that next word. Live as God's servants. Then we took communion together. Yes, we took the Lord's Supper. We celebrated the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And right now as we're walking through Lent in this season, we're preparing for Easter, right? 
Some of you guys are with me. That's okay. The rest of you will come along, I know. We're getting ready to celebrate Easter. Well, on that morning, it was the first Sunday of November, and we were celebrating communion. We took that communion together. That afternoon, Diana and I packed, and we got ready to go to our pastors and spouses retreat. We got to be there with Marcia. We got to be there with all of our different pastor friends and stuff. And we got to celebrate some of the good things that God was doing around our district and in our personal lives, sharing together. And on Wednesday, we came home. That night, Diana and I had dinner with our family. And then we came home. We dropped our suitcases at the front door. And we took off and went to bed and crashed. That was Wednesday night. Paradise, California. November 8th, 2018, that next morning changed our world forever. There was an early ominous threat which appeared on the horizon. When the sun had barely come up, the threat became such a reality with that firestorm quickly moving through our town. It was absolutely changing everything that was taking place around us. You've all seen the devastation on TV. You've all had a chance to hear it in all kinds of news broadcasts, right? There was a lot of emotional distress on that day. Some of us who are chaplains know about distress on a regular basis because we deal with that on a regular basis. But this was far and above higher and greater because people were not just disturbed. People were literally running for their lives. People were jumping up and they were running to their neighbors' houses. They were knocking on the doors and saying, get out now, get out now. Some people listened and some people didn't. Worried citizens were watching other people who might be jumping out of their car and they would stop and pick them up and say, get in our vehicle, as their car was burning right next to them. Darkness became a norm in town that was not normal in any way, shape, or form by 8 o'clock in the morning. All the businesses and all the homes which normally would see a beautiful fall morning with a little bit of crispness in the air only saw dark clouds and flames. Escapes were all recorded on people's hearts and minds forever. As people drove through the fires, literally... They feared not only for their lives, but for the lives of everyone else in line with them who were stuck in traffic and unable to move. Some of our cars had rubber burnt off of them and falling off. Other people's tires began to burn and they had to jump out of their cars, which went down to nothing, and run for their lives through the fire. Many stories, and they're all their own stories, and I can't tell you all the stories of the people. Even though I've heard thousands of them, I cannot tell you all their stories because it's their story. But today I'm going to share with you a little bit of our story. All the stories are captivating. All the stories are terrifying for the person hearing it as well as for the one who is reliving the event through their words and their thoughts. As you know, Fire is no respecter of persons, places, or things. You got that, right? I'm going to have my wife Diana come and share with you some of what she went through that morning as she began this day. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I know I don't speak very loud, so I'm going to try really hard. So... Um, Lloyd shared that we'd come home the night before and dropped our suitcases by the door, fully packed. And now you would think, that was great. I bet you got those suitcases out when you evacuated the next day. We did not. They, when I got up that morning, I didn't even know there was a fire. Um, I just went about my normal morning routine. It looked a little bit overcast outside. I picked my ugliest outfit because I was planning on cleaning. I run a childcare center 
And we had the state coming in the next day to do some uh, evaluations for us. And so I planned, since I'd been out of town for a few days, to spend that day organizing, cleaning, getting our play environment set up, and uh, just general maintenance around our daycare. So I put on a sweater I hated, a pair of jeans I didn't like, some clunky boots that I never wear, and uh, I had some daycare kids get dropped off at my house about 6.45. Um, because I, their mom has to be at work before our daycare opens. So they come to me early, and I drop one of them at school on my way down the hill. Time to leave comes, and I can't find my car keys because my son, who's 20, who lived with us, had used my car while we were on retreat, and he'd lost the keys somewhere in the house. And so I woke him up and said, you've got to get up and drive me to work in dad's car and then you know bring it back to him because he needs it later and uh, so we get up we get the kids loaded in the car we go outside and it's over it, what looked like overcast from inside the house when we came outside I realized it was a giant plume of smoke on the horizon and my neighbor was just getting in his truck to go and drive out and see where the smoke was coming from Oh, I'm not that girl, so I pulled my phone out and checked social media because we have, you know, we have local groups that report on things like that. They listen to the scanner. And I get online and I see that fire is 10 miles away in Pulga. And I think, 10 miles, that's nothing. It's, but it was so big. The, the, the smoke was so big. I said to my son, I'm going to run back in, make sure the girls are getting up for school. My two daughters, Zoe and Abigail. Zoe's a senior, Abigail's a sophomore. And they drive to school every day in Chico. And, and I went back in, the girls were up, they were getting ready for school. I said, girls, it looks like there's a fire on the horizon. Now we live in the mountains, in the foothills. We see those fires happen all the time. We've had them burn up kind of close to town. We've had them burn a little bit of town, but we've never had any, it's never amounted to anything before. So it was just kind of an informational statement there. There's a fire. Um, maybe before you leave, make sure dad's awake. He didn't have a morning appointment, so I wasn't sure what time he was going to be getting up, and it was still really early. Before, it wasn't even eight o'clock yet. Um, <clears throat> so I said, wake dad up before you go and let him know there's a fire just so he can be ready. And I leave. And we start to drive. We get a couple miles away from the house and we get to an opening in the trees where you can see out across the canyon and I can see fire coming down the opposite side. And I said to my son, you're gonna have to drop me and get right back up the hill. We live eight miles from my daycare. We get a few more miles down the road to the school where I'm supposed to drop off my daycare child. And they're waving people. They're not even letting them in the parking lot. We're not, no kids today. Look at, there were embers the size of my hand dropping into the parking lot. And I pull my phone out. <laughs> And I, call, I start making some phone calls. First, I tried to call those daycare children's parents. And I couldn't get a hold of them. Left messages. Called my business partner down at our daycare. And she didn't pick up. Called my oldest son, who lives above us in Megalia, to make sure he was up. Told him there was a fire. Told him he might want to start gathering some things got down to the daycare. Now normally, on a normal day, we have 14 children under five. And by 8.15 in the morning, we would have had 10 to 12 of them already there. That morning, parents had started realizing. And they'd already either come and picked their children up or they hadn't brought them in the first place. But we still had about six children there. 
We're calling parents. My business partner and her husband, who's come home from work already, are throwing things in their car. And I take the children downstairs to feed them breakfast and try to call, keep everybody calm. Parents start showing up. We're eating breakfast. The power goes out. I'm on my phone because I'm trying to manage what's going on. I'm calling Lloyd, I'm calling my son Christopher, I'm calling my son Zachary, who's supposed to be driving back up to get his dad. And what I'm getting is I'm stuck in traffic. I can't, they've turned, they're turning us around and everybody's just sitting in the road. We can't even move. And then every call I get after that was worse. When I can get a call through, it's a snippet. And it's from Lloyd, we can't get out. We're sheltering in place in a parking lot here. From my son, Zach, who says, I'm they've rerouted me again, I'm still stuck on the road. We get the daycare kids that we still have left, there's two of them. We get on the road, we get to Chico. And I'm so thankful, my partner Katie, that I run the daycare with her husband, volunteers with the sheriff's department, and he has police radios in his car, all the cars. So we get out and the road is stop traffic. And we've got children, Katie's starting to freak out a little bit, and Jake, these emergency vehicles go screaming past us going down. And Katie's husband on the radio says, get behind them and go. And we pulled out behind in the upward lane going down behind those emergency vehicles. And we sped down the road. And people behind us all pulled out and followed. We got to Chico much, much faster than most people who evacuated. <laughs> And when we got to Chico and we um, found a spot to be, which at first was McDonald's because they had Playland and we had children, it looked like that scene after the 9-11 tragedy happened and you had all those people just sitting on planters or sitting on the curb with their, their head in their hands, that's what it looked like in the parking lot of McDonald's. People are just looking up the hill at the smoke and the dark and they've all just evacuated many people are on their phones nobody knows what to do and they're just sitting there and in the middle of all that I got a call I got a few calls from pastors other pastors from our district you know, we're part of a bigger thing here. The Church of the Nazarene, those pastors care about each other. These churches care about each other. And in the bigger Christian community also. But I start getting calls from pastors who can't get a hold of Lloyd because his phone is not receiving calls. And they want to know what's happening. They want to know how I am, how Lloyd is. And they want to know what they can do to help. And the pastor from the Chico Nazarene Church, and, and you've probably, they had a uh, evacuation center there. Oroville Naz had an evacuation center. He says, come, bring your people, and come, and I'm going to open my house up to you. Just find me when you get here. You can go be in our home. You can have some food. You can rest. You can charge your phones. And that was a cup of cold water right there because I had not just myself and you know my son who eventually made it to us and my daughters who were in Chico at school and my business partner and her husband and her father and her children and I still had two daycare children with me and then you know, other church people that were finding me. And I had this little group I needed to take care of. It was actually a pretty good sized group. <laughs> it wasn't a little group. I needed to do something with these people. And McDonald's Playland wasn't going to cut it for long. Though Olivia, who's four, 
came up to me and said, I was sitting by her mom and she said, Mommy, thank you for the very fun fire field trip. <laughs> We're having a fire field trip. She, she was very excited. <laughs> um, we are part of a bigger thing. When we reach out in these times of crisis, the body of Christ offers this comfort. I had a place to go. I had a place to gather myself. In the middle of, you know, not being able to hear from my husband or hearing very little, in the middle of trying to find where everybody in my family was, I had a place to be. And that was because people reached out. And, um, and when you reach out, it means something. Amen. It means something. And we do that as Christians. We do that as part of this larger body that we belong to. And, um, and that day, that was, that was the thing that kind of helped me hold it together and hold my family together. And when we were finally all back together, we were able to to regroup and we were able to, to, to have some comfort from each other. Amen. And so this has been, you know, it's a hard thing that we go through. We go through lots of hard things, but pay attention to those hard things that people are going through because you might be that person to offer that cup of cold water. Amen, thank you, Donna. true we are the body of Christ and I know some of you were able to get up and go to paradise I mean go to Chico and some of you were able to go and help out in that area there at East Avenue Church thank you for your stepping forward and being the hands and feet of Jesus in the days to follow this disaster well my son and I we looked and we said this is incredible because we couldn't get out until late that night. And I'm letting this happen so that you can see these pictures. But that day, we were there all day long watching the smoke roll by in front of us, hearing the booms, boom, boom, feeling the booms all over town of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of propane tanks going off in the fire. It felt like a war zone. It looked like a war zone. And we could see when houses would go up in flames because all the smoke would change colors and you would see and hear the results. That night, my son and I had uh, some officers come by and they brought three vans for all the people. We were in defensible space in a parking lot. And in that space there, they came up and they said, we need you guys to get together and get in these vans and we're going to take you out, out of here. So I went up to one of the officers. As a chaplain, I was kind of bold. And I said, where are you taking us? He says, we don't know. <laughs> I said, then I'm not going to go. And we came up with a plan where one of them would take us out and would actually lead a few of our cars down through. And we didn't have much gas. We had less than an eighth of a tank of gas. We weren't sure how far we would actually get. But I thought, well, you know what? I, I could maybe get down and see Diana because I didn't know what was happening with her in the daycare. I didn't have cell coverage. And sure enough, as soon as we got down the hill, the street that would have taken us down Skyway, the main road in Paradise, was blocked by a fire truck. So they actually rerouted us and took us down Pence Road, which was the most burnt that we heard out of the entire day. We heard Pence was absolutely all in flames. And sure enough, the pictures you see there are from that area. As we drove through, it was nighttime already, but the darkness was the same darkness that was there before. Everything was burning on both sides of the roads. Our gym was gone. We drove by the top picture, and I could see that there was not a mobile home standing in the whole park as we drove by. That was shocking to me. We drove by the hospital, which was on fire. We drove by all these places, and God got us out safe. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. In the days to follow, 
we discovered what most people feared. All of these mobile home parks in the entire town were gone. Neighborhoods, as you can see, were completely destroyed. And many lives were lost. Some were found. Of course, the National News and Paradise uh, had Paradise posted on every single website. It was on every news broadcast. Special investigation experts were all over everything. National and state emergency agencies were brought along with law enforcement officials and us chaplains to look for survivors and then have to go and speak with the families when we found them. Three days after the fire, God reminded me of a scripture that he had been pressing into me for about three weeks. And I didn't get it. I'd gone to the men's group and I said, what do you guys think of this? Why is God sharing this scripture with me? I get it for Jesus. I get it. He fulfilled this scripture. Absolutely. I know it. I understand it. But why me? Why is he impressing this scripture on me? The scripture is taken from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 6, and, and we're going to look at it here really quickly because three days after the fire, all of a sudden it went like this. <laughs> oh my goodness. Lord, you were saying that? Let's look at this together. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. You think there was any poor people there after that fire? We all lost everything on that day. We were all poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Were there any brokenhearted in paradise? To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. <laughs> I think you can make the connection. We were mourning losing everything. Some people lost family members. But we lost everything. Everything. We got out with the clothes on our back. We didn't get all of our cars. Dot, 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 but God. To comfort all who mourn. Provide for those who grieve in Zion. I put paradise in there. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of... What? To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of... Ashes. Was God ahead of the game? The oil of joy instead of mourning. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. All of those were active emotions and feelings and experiences on that day and those days following. I love the transition of Isaiah. And I believe it's a transition of Almighty God for this event and for what is to come, which is why this is called Hope for Paradise. Are you ready? Oh, look at what it says next. They will be called Oaks of Righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Have you guys ever been planted as righteous people where you live? Okay, I had to stop the car. And I had to back up. Say it again. Have you ever been planted somewhere as an oak of righteousness for your neighborhood, your community, your family? He has more for you than you've possibly ever dreamed if you will choose to be His planting, a planting of righteousness where you live with what you go through, with where you're going. He's not just doing it for paradise. He wants to do it in your home. He wants to do it in your neighborhood. He wants to do it in your community. He wants to do it all over Sacramento, just like He did in Isaiah's day, and He's going to do in paradise.
What is the reason why he's going to plant these oaks of righteousness? For the display of his splendor. He's planting them so they're going to grow up as a display of his splendor. <laughs> There's going to be a new paradise. <laughs> okay, all six of you that were celebrating that, I'm glad. There is going to be a new paradise because it's God's place. It is not a human place of human responsibility and resources. Yes, people are trying to do their own thing, but they can't do it without God planting those righteous oaks in paradise. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. I tell you what, man. If you knew about paradise and the title of paradise, some people said it was actually called Pair of Dice. The ancient ruins is a true thing. There was a lot of ruin in that town. It was built on a gold nugget, for goodness sake. A gold nugget. We celebrate gold nugget days. Aren't you glad there's going to be a planting of righteousness by the Lord? It's not going to be built around a gold nugget. It'll be built around the display of His splendor. Whoo! Bless the Lord. And restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Thank you, Lord. Now you can clap and say, thank you, Lord. Yeah. How could God mobilize enough people to be able to transform an entire town that is completely gone? There's only about 10% of the structure still left out of all of paradise. It's all gone. All of the water system is gone. As a matter of fact, you can't drink water in paradise. You can't take showers in paradise. You can't wash your clothes and wash your dishes in paradise because there's benzene in all of the pipes. The pipes were completely destroyed, not melted down to nothing, but they were destroyed because the fire got into the pipes and burned the plastic pipes and caused a chemical reaction which created benzene to now be in all the pipes in all of paradise. You want water? You'd better find that little bottle that goes like this and take a shower like this. Right? If you want a drink, you've got to not find the tap. You have to find the bottle. How is God going to take this tragedy of burned piles of ash and turn them into beauty? How could he replace mourning and despair with joy and praise in a place like this, like Isaiah talked about, like God spoke about? Well, there were rapid response teams that descended on our town. By the way, that is our church building after the fire. That's the Paradise Community Church of the Nazarene. Now, you can't see everything around it burned. You can see our sign on the left hand, well, yeah, on the left hand side of, of the, the mobile home there. It's gone. All of the trees, all of everything around it are gone now. All of the things, and you'll see a picture later that shows what it was like a little bit before the fire, but it's different. The youth building's gone. The other structures, all the neighbors' houses are gone. There's nothing around it except rubble and ash and burnt out cars all around it. Agencies like Samaritan's Purse rallied to send support to our region. I don't know if you can see me there in the top part there. I'm holding one of those MyPillow.coms. I'm so glad I could sleep in with that. Those are the, those are the guys that came to our house.